Okay, so I'm going to model a simple rock just to show the workflow of working between Maya and ZBrush. So I'm going to start just by making a cube. And keep in mind that a default cube in Maya is the size of a sugar cube because one unit here means one centimeter. So I want a bigger rock than that. So I'm going to start off, let's use 32. I'll make the height a little bit larger here. I'll say 64. There we go. Uh, now I'll go into vertex mode. And I'll just adjust this a little bit, so I want the top to be a little bit smaller. I'm tip it over a little bit. I'm not going to do much here because I'm going to do most of the work here in ZBrush. But let's just edit this a little bit, so get ourselves a shape. Good. We'll call that good enough, because we can bring this into ZBrush. We're obviously going to do a lot more sculpting, and that'll be fine. So what you do want to do before you bring it into ZBrush, um, you want to make sure the object is positioned as you'd like and everything. Um, and one thing I'd like to do is just to make sure that if I go into my wireframe view, just push 4 on the keyboard, uh, I can see this all below the grid there. And if I want to just sort of put this on the ground, then I can just go into vertex mode, select all the verts, and move them up, and then it's on the ground. Now I do that in vertex mode uh, because that way it doesn't edit the transforms on the object, which I prefer to just leave the way they are. So I'm going to call that good enough. I'm going to edit in ZBrush anyway, but it's pretty close. So you're going to see that right there, when I move the verts, I sort of see the manipulator here. But when I go back into object mode, the man manipulator shows up down here, and that's because this is still the pivot point of the object. So the pivot point of the object is completely at the default settings, and its transform is all zeroed out. And uh, generally what you want to have is you want to have an object which is with its pivot point at the origin with no parent object, so don't have the object parented anything, um, have frozen transforms, and then delete the history. So one thing I'm going to do before I delete the history here is I'm just going to make some very quick automatic mapping. Not that it matters very much, but it's good to just throw some kind of mapping on it. Um, and then I'll delete the history. So I can delete the history by hitting Shift, Alt, and D. There we go. So now the history's gone. You can also, of course, go edit, delete by type, history. But the hotkey of Alt-Shift-D works um, much faster most of the time. And it's a nice built-in hotkey in Maya, so I just thought it was worth mentioning. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to set this up to export. Um, and I want to be able to export OBJ files. Um, I'm going to mostly work with OBJ files and MA files in this export process here. So I'm going to go to Window, Settings, Preferences, Plugin Manager, and make sure that OBJ export is loaded, and I can have auto load check so that it stays loaded later uh, when I start Maya again. So That's good. So because OBJ export is turned on there in the plugin settings, uh, I should be able to go File, Export Selection. And now I can export this. Now this is very much a temporary file. It's not something I care about. So for these temporary files, I'm just going to call them Delete Me makes it very obvious that you can delete the file later and it doesn't matter to you. Uh, the files that I actually care about, I'm going to save additional ZBrush files and my files. These OBJ files that I'm making, they're just really temporary garbage. Um, so I'll save that. Um, sometimes you can also use my files, particularly if you have any special kind of information. Um, so if you have creases or any other kind of information that you want to keep on the model, which sometimes is worthwhile, then you can bring that across to, and normally to do that you can actually save, save MA files. And ZBrush can read and write uh, MA files with limited success. As long as your files are really simple, it'll work um, just to move data in and out of ZBrush. Um, you know, so I could make a delete me file for that as well. Not that I really need to in this situation because it's such a simple object. But that's it for the start of the object, and now I will move into ZBrush and show how you can keep working with that. So to work in this to work with this object in ZBrush, I'm going to go just to import, and I'm going to choose that file that I just made. Um, sometimes you can try using the MA file, but even if you have an MA file and you want to bring some data in, what I usually find works better is I'll open the uh, OBJ file. I'll import the OBJ file first, um, and then after that comes in correctly. I'll import the MA file. Very often if you import the MA file directly, you'll get strange errors the, for the first time when you're just starting it up. 
So I usually like to use the OBJ file first, and then once I've sort of got that working okay, uh, then I'll bring the MA file in. For some reason, ZBrush often bugs out when you open an MA file right away. So we'll just try this. So I just grab the OBJ file. So I can drag this out on the canvas just by left clicking. There we go. So I can drag this out. I can hold down shift on the keyboard if I want to kind of snap it and keep it aligned to the axis here. Um, and then you have to be careful because if you do any other mouse clicks, you'll sort of make this into a two-dimensional object and won't be able to work with it anymore. So in order to uh, start editing this, I have to go into edit mode right away. And I can use edit or I can just push T on the keyboard, which is the hotkey. So I can just push T right now. Tap. There we go. Now it jumps into edit mode. And now I can orbit around. And you're going to see that when I orbit around, it's orbiting pretty much like Maya for me right now. And that's because I'm in um, this mode. ZBrush defaults, of course, to uh, this XYZ rotating, and that means that when you orbit around, your object is going to sort of spin around, it's going to go sideways, it's going to flip upside down uh, really easily, just when you're sort of looking around at it. Um, and I often find that pretty infuriating. So what you can do is, instead, you can just, hold, you can just start rotating, and then hold down Shift while you're uh, rotating or orbiting around it there. There we go. Um, and let go. And then if I go into rotate on Y axis here, now if I drag with the right mouse button and I just orbit around my object, you can see now it doesn't tilt or roll around in crazy ways. So that really helps. Um, there's a good chance you also want to just turn on the floor and show perspective. And that just gives us a better understanding of our object in 3D space. Um, of course, you can turn that floor on and off. And you can turn the perspective on and off too, but I almost always like to have perspective on. Uh, ZBrush has quite a bit of perspective by default. Um, so very often, particularly if you're modeling characters, uh, humans or something like that, um, you know, most portrait photography is taken at a much lower field of view and it has less perspective than we have here. So if I go into draw, top menu, you'll see there's actually angle of view. And if I turn this down, I'll get less extreme perspective. So we'll still have perspective. Things will still get smaller in the background. It's just not going to be as strong. Uh, it's a lot better of an alternative than turning off perspective completely. Because, of course, real life always has some perspective whenever you're looking at objects. We never have zero perspective. So this is a lot more realistic than just turning it right off. And you see it's a pretty subtle difference in here, but it makes a really big difference when you're character modeling or something. And you don't want to be modeling with with no perspective most of the time. So it's a good idea to have at least some perspective. And just turn it down using uh, draw and then the angle of view control right here. I don't want to have to worry too much about the topology of this rock as I edit it for a little bit, I just want to work really free form. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into geometry mode here, and I'm going to go into Dynamesh, and I'm going to turn this on. And then you're going to see the ZBrush is going to automatically make new polygons, new vertices, and it's going to allow me to get a lot more control over sculpting this object, because of course I wouldn't have had any verts to sculpt there if I undo a couple times back to before Dynamesh is on. Right. I can't click and drag and sculpt in the middle of the surface because there just aren't any verts there. So you need to actually have detail uh, on the model if you want to be able to sculpt in those places. Uh, and later on, we're going to want to have much better edge flow and all that, but for now, it'll work well enough if we just turn on Dynamesh and kind of sculpt out the object the way we want, and then we'll build more proper topology for it afterwards. So I go in here and just change this model a little, so do some basic sculpting. This, of course, is however you want your object to look. Uh, if you're too strong, we just turn this down a little bit. I just don't want such extreme motion happening. Let's just keep this pretty minimal. There we go. Uh, I'm going to go into the flatten brush here, so let's choose flatten. Then I can just grab some parts here. Yeah. Uh, you can see part of the model, you know, it starts to crash through itself, so it's look pretty ugly there. Uh, whenever you think that the verts aren't really supporting what you're doing very well, uh, you can redynamesh it. So if I hold, just hold down control um, and I drag a window out here, if I just do this a couple times, um, then it'll run Dynamesh. If you already have it masked, 
then the first time you hold down control and you drag that window, you'll just remove the mask. But the second time, you'll redynamesh it again. So this allows me to go through and just get whatever kind of control I want in there. There we go. Of course, I can change my brush size. Just play around with different looks for this. But, you know, essentially just sculpt this up however I want. Hold down shift, I can smooth it. Um, very often you won't want the wireframe on the go, so I can just hit shift F to toggle that on and off. And of course I can just turn the floor off here temporarily. Um, you know, they're both things I like to have sometimes, but they're not always useful. There's times when you're sculpting when you don't want to have them. So. Really, I'm just doing a lot of different, uh, you know, smooths, flattens, things like that. So it's a good idea to change your brush size pretty often. So if you just tap space, you can uh, or hold space. You can quickly use this there to change the size. You can also push uh, the square brackets on the keyboard, which is just like Photoshop to make the brush bigger and smaller. Oh, make sure it's a bit smaller here. Go in and uh, just keep using combinations of flatten and smooth and just the standard brush. And I'm not doing anything too complicated here. Remember to keep changing that brush size or it'll really look like you were doing it with you know, strokes that were all the same and it'll start to look really computerized and artificial because it'll all be too perfect and too much the same. So make sure you're editing that quite a bit. Um, you know, we got these edges that are really, really sharp. You can just smooth them out, just hold down shift and drag and paint on it. There we go. Again, just you know, keep changing those sizes. This is very much looking a little too uniform for me, so just make sure we mess that up a little. Uh, you know, if you do a bit of painting side to side, you can help with that. You know, instead of just painting strokes, just kind of make sure you're using little kind of squiggly strokes here and there. Uh, that'll really help. There we go. Okay, so just about done here. Um, let's just use some fairly low intensity, just a little bit more fairly low intensity flattening. That's good. Um, you can use the polish brushes too. They do pretty similar things to the flattening. Um, and if you want like a really extreme flatten, there's a planer brush you can use that goes really extreme. It can be a little difficult to use, but sometimes it's useful. So there we go. It's not too bad. So now what we want is we want to get some topology for this object that makes sense because right now the wireframe on this object is of course completely useless. So what we want to do is we want to um, send this back to Maya, um, you know, make some topology. Now, what I like to do is I normally like to have the object fairly low detail. You notice I don't have a lot of little bumps uh, or small cracks or details or anything like that in here. Um, however, I do want to point out that you can have a lot more detail. So for example, um, there's nothing stopping me from having a lot more. And one quick way I can do that is like if I just grab the crumple brush here and I just use a fairly low intensity and a fairly low size. 
What I need to do is I'm just going to crumple this object quite a bit. And as I do this, we're going to start getting just some small little details, all based on how I'm kind of shaking the mouse. All right, we're going to see that I'm I'm getting a lot of very small uh, little lines and cracks in it and whatnot, and that's all just based on my mouse motion here. It's basically the idea is similar to crumpling aluminum foil or something with the crumple brush. Works quite well. Uh, there's a lot of other brushes that I can use to really quickly add some detail. I usually prefer to add this detail in later because right now any detail that I add I'm going to have to recover that. So I normally like to kind of get the good topology in there before I do a lot of detailing on the object. I pretty much uh, will go back into Maya and, and retopo it earlier. But again, I'm just going to make this so you can see that even if you do a lot of detail, it is possible to recover that even after you sort of remodel your object in Maya. There we go. Um, you know, if you're worried about the Dynamesh kind of breaking and uh, you think that you've crashed a lot of points, you've got a lot of, say, self-intersections on the models or, you know, places where the surface is kind of crashing through itself because of all the crumpling and everything, um, it's just a good idea to use a higher resolution and Dynamesh it again. So let's use, like, 400 here and try again. Let's do Dynamesh again, and that looks pretty solid. Right, you're going to see it, of course, recreates all that geometry. Um, but it tries to keep our shape as intact as possible. And it will generally have the object make sense after you do that. So the object won't have any sort of holes or self-intersections or whatever once you dynamesh it. Typically, it'll fix up most of the problems on it. So one thing I can do just to get a little bit of detail back, here, I'm just going to turn off dynamesh here. Hit divide a couple times. There we go just to demonstrate how I can recover some of the detail. I'll put some detail in here for now. I'm just going to do it with this really simple uh, deformation and noise. So I turn this noise up just a little bit. Of course, if I turn it up high, it goes pretty crazy. If I turn it up just a tiny bit, I'll just get a little bit of interesting detail with it there, and that's fine. And then, of course, I can uh, go back up to another level. So of course, every time I hit divide, right here I get a new level, and if I scroll down, there's the original level, which was made by Dynamesh. There's that Dynamesh divided once. There's the Dynamesh divided again. So let's just add a little bit more noise at the second level. Again, I want it to be pretty subtle. I'm not trying to do too much here. That's even more than I need. You know, I'm at like two or something, that's just fine. So, if I thought that was worked okay, I can just click in here and say 2, enter, there we go. I was having a hard time getting the slider exactly where I want it, so if you're trying to get an exact number, of course, you just click on it and type a number in, so that works pretty well. So there we go. Now there's a bit more detail on the object. You know, it's not tons. It's enough. It'll, uh, it'll provide for what we need at the moment. So that's detail that I could get back if I wanted to. So now I'm able to send this back to Maya. So again, I'll just, um, I'm just going to export this as an OBJ. Uh, the thing is that this model right now, particularly if I go to the uh, smoothed out version of this model, it's really high poly. It's like 4 million points here. Um, if I hold over it too, it says the actual, you know, polys are the triangle count, right? And again, that's, you know, close to 4 million. So the vert, verts and verts is points and the polygons here just means triangles. So it's very high right now. Uh, Maya's not going to handle that very well. I want to have the Maya model down. If I'm going to bring this into reference and I'm going to recreate it in Maya, I want to have the Maya model down a lot lower. So I'm going to go into the subtool palette here, and I'm going to duplicate this one. So my original one here, I'm going to call it Sculpt. 
I have this duplicate and I'll call this decimate or decimated and we're going to decimate this model which means we're just going to lower the poly count way down so to do that uh, now that I've got this one backed up and I've got my original sculpt and I've got the decimated one if I want to just see one of them at a time I want to make sure that they don't uh, crash through each other I go down here and I can turn on solo mode now if I click on one and I click on the other we'll only ever see one of them at a time and they're exactly in the same place so it doesn't even really make a difference right now uh, but once I, once I change this model, we'll see the subtle difference when I go back and forth. So to decimate it, I'm just going to hit Z plugin, go to Decimation Master, hit Preprocess Current. That's going to preprocess the model. So it just thinks about it. Um, this is just analyzing it so we can figure out how to lower the poly count on it. And it's going to, once I uh, actually do use the decimate on it, it's going to try to keep as much of the details it can. Uh, while drastically reducing the poly count. So you can decimate just a little bit, um, or you can decimate a lot if you really want to knock the polys down. And I will decimate by a lot. So, you know, I'll I'll go from like 4 million to um, like a 100,000 poly model or something. So sometimes decimating can take a little while, um, but honestly it'll save you way more time if you do this, because of course mine would be so slow if we had a 4 million poly model model in Maya. Um, and because in Maya you don't need any of that intricate detail, you just need the overall shape because you're going to make such a low poly uh, base mesh for it in Maya anyway, um, there's no point in bringing in something super high poly. Like even the decimated object is way higher poly than it needs to be in this case. Okay, so now the model has been analyzed for decimation. So now if I go back, because that's been pre-processed, that's the uh, analysis of it, uh, now I can go back and I could just use decimate here again. So first I'm going to start off just by saying um, you know, what percentage of the poly count I want. I want really low. So I'm going to go here and say you know, like 100,000. That's fine. And then I'm going to say decimate current. So now the computer is going to think uh, ZRush is going to take the poly count of this object way down. It's going to remove tons of the uh, detail in the object. Uh, because it's been analyzed, it's been pre-processed, it's fairly quick. It's a lot faster than you might expect it to be. Uh, if I look at the wireframe now, the wireframe is going to be a disaster. It's just like pure triangles. But the wireframe was already pretty bad. So um, it should be just fine like this. But this is something I can bring into Maya, and it's not going to be way too heavy for Maya. I mean, this is only 50,000 triangles right now, or 50,000 verts right now. And I mean, it's probably a similar count of polys. Oh, well, poly's about 100,000, but that's not bad. It's, uh, I guess because it's all totally triangulated here. Anyway, um, I can just export this, and I'll just export the OBJ file. Um, I'll probably want to save this first. So I have my, you know, sculpt one and the decimated one. Um, this is, at this point, the real file. So I want to save this just as a regular ZBrush file. Let's go save. I'm saving it as rock. And I just had a garbage file there for the old one. So there we go. And then I've got export. So I'm going to export just right over this delete me file again, which is a complete garbage file. And I don't care if I lose it. So just export over it. Great. So I've got the ZBrush one. And that's the real file that I actually care about. And it's named and it makes sense and everything. The delete me file is a completely temporary one that I'm just using to go back and forth between Maya and ZBrush. So now um, I can leave ZBrush, go back into Maya, and open up this object to use as a reference and create a new mesh for it. So let's switch over now. So in my Maya scene, of course, I had that old object. Uh, this object is almost completely useless at this point. If I wanted to, I could just call it. old base shape or something. Just put it on a layer here. I'll just call this layer old lay. There we go. Basically things I don't need can go on there. And then uh, I'm going to go to file import and I'll grab that delete me file that I just saved out of ZBrush. Here it is. Um, so this is my reference geometry. 
So this is what I'm going to model over top of. So I'll select it, and I'll call this ref geo, and then I'll make a new layer here. So with it selected, if I push this button, it'll make a new layer, and it'll put the selection on the layer. There we go. Double click on the layer. I'll just call this ref lay, lay for layer. OK, so now I can easily uh, turn the visibility on and off. Um, I can also put it into reference mode here, which is when I click in this box, it toggles between blank and then T and R. R for this reference mode, it means it's not selectable. So it means even if I try to select it, it won't actually get selected in the view. Um, that can be really useful. One other thing that can be very useful here is that if I select this object and I apply a new material to it, so I'll just right click and I'll say apply new material. Choose Lambert in this box that pops up. There we go. So this is really simple Lambert material. Um, and what I can do with this very simple Lambert material is I'll just call it ref mat. Um, but I'll change the transparency here. So I can set a key on it so that right at the beginning there's no transparency. And then I can go to the end of my time slider here. And I can turn the transparency all the way up to maximum. And I can set another key. And then when I move the time slider, you can see that object fade in and out. And that can be very useful for when I'm modeling a new object over top of it. Um, sometimes this object's going to visually like get in the way. So this will allow me to see it or not see it, um, which is a nice you know maybe middle ground between just entirely turning it off or on again. So um, Now I've got that set up, and I'm ready to start uh, modeling over top of this. So I can select the reference model here, and I'm going to say Modify Make Live. And that's how we let Maya know that this is the object that we're using as our reference model, and we're going to be drawing on top of this object. So we'll be making new um, geometry to match up with this object. So Make Live is Maya's feature, essentially, for drawing on the surface of objects and such. So now that I've done that, now I'll just get a brand new cube. There we go. I will call this Retopo. This is going to be my new topology, my new model. Um, I'm just going to change the width here to make it wide enough that I can see it. Uh, I'm not going to use any of the geometry. I actually don't care about these polygons, because I'm just going to make completely new polygons. I just want to be able to see them so that later on I can click on them and delete them. Uh, really easily. So just making the width is enough there um, to make it easy to click on. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this tool called the Quad Draw tool. So I go to Mesh Tools and choose Quad Draw. There we go. Uh, and what I can do with this is I can click on the surface and I can actually make new polygons just by drawing on here. So if I, each time I click, it makes a vertex. There we go. And I hold down Shift, and I put the mouse over it. It'll show that this could potentially be filled in with a quad. So while I'm holding down Shift, uh, when it shows me this green highlight, if I left click, there we go. It makes an actual polygon. Uh, if I temporarily hide the rock for a second, you're going to see there's the new polygon I just made. Now, as soon as I have even just one more polygon, I don't need this cube anymore. I really just had the polygons on this cube here so that I can start adding onto it. Um, so if I just go into face mode, just right click, go to face mode, or push F11 on the keyboard, then I can double click on these faces. And because they're all welded to each other, uh, they have merged verts, because they're connected there, um, it'll select them all together when I double click on them. It'll select the entire um, shell or element or continuous mesh, whatever you want to call it, of all the different objects put together or sorry, all the different faces put together here. So I can push delete, and that'll knock out all those touching um, merged faces. And now we can go back to the quad draw tool. So mesh quad draw tool. There we go. I can give myself some more transparency again if I want. And now I can go in and do some more work with quad draw. So I can just put some more verts in here. Just trying to put verts that I think are um, going to support the shape well. And what I'm actually trying to do is I'm trying to make polygons 
and I'm trying to make edges here that flow nicely with the shape of the object. They create polygons that are roughly square and that are roughly all the same size, um, you know, and that describe this shape well. It's hard to do all those things together. Uh, I'm also going to try to make it as many quads as possible and as few triangles as possible. Um, it's tough to get all those things perfect at the same time. I mean, in many cases, it's impossible to get all those things perfect at the same time. So really, I'm just trying to do a, you know, a decent job here, not a perfect job. It doesn't have to be absolutely flawless. It just has to, you know, get it done reasonably well. Um, ideally, I'd like to avoid things like spiral edge loops and things as well. So I'm looking at this part of the model here that comes around and I actually want it to connect back here. I don't want it to go around and come down in here. So I'm gonna have to keep that in mind as I'm building that part. But let's keep going around here. So here's maybe a good opportunity to uh, to get around that spiral because it looks like right here there's a place where the edge between this part and this part isn't so strong. So I'll try to go down here. That kind of goes against the flow, but. It'll also help us connect back up to here without any strange spiraling going on. There we go. So if I hold down shift, I get candidates to fill in. So this one's a bit strange because it doesn't really match the shape too well, but by having that there, I can connect back to here, which is quite important to me in this situation. Because so, I want to get a nice kind of clean edge loop that runs around this whole section. I mean, ideally, these edge loops, they line up with the features of the object as well as you can, but it's also important to try to get shapes that flow well with the object. And, you know, it's nice, um, not only the flow well with the object, but that actually wrap around and meet themselves again. So the flow with the object that actually form proper loops around the object. Um, if the line doesn't come back towards itself, uh, then it might kind of start spiraling up and down. Whereas you want the line to go around uh, and line up with itself again, to just be a, a closed loop. All right, so I'll keep building on here. Now, you can see that it's quite a lot of polygons around here, right? And this place is much smaller. I want polygons to be the same size. So I can't have this many polygons up at the top. I'm going to have to have just a few up at the top. Because otherwise, they're going to be a terribly different size. So I'm going to try to make a couple polygons here to represent this top part. There we go. Um, you know, and these are similar sizes to the other ones. They're in the same kind of ballpark. Remember, they're not going to be perfect. They're all going to be exactly the same size, but you want to be in that general area in terms of size. Nice, and then that connects okay. So basically down here, I'm gonna have to do something. I'm gonna have to try, have to have a triangle or something, but that's not necessarily a big problem. Um, particularly in the really low res versions of things, uh, you don't have to be worried about a couple of triangles here and there. As long as you have good edge flow structure, that's the most important thing. Um, once we smooth this once, once we actually start to get a model that's a little bit higher poly, and you never want your, your ultimate model to be this low poly anyway. Um, so once we actually 
get into a situation where we have a model that's just a little bit higher poly, you're going to see that it becomes all quads anyway, and we don't end up with uh, too many triangles, um, or even any triangles at, at the later stages of the process. Um, we have to remember with triangles just that there are situations where they'll cause your pipeline some sorts of problems, and just make sure that however you're using them, you're using them in ways that aren't going to cause you problems later down the line. That's something you sort of, you'll you learn more about as you sort of understand more of the entire production pipeline and everything. Um, but particularly if you know of some way that's going to get rid of the triangles fairly early on in the process, then you don't have to worry too much about having some for a while. So like right here, I'm not too worried about that triangle. Uh, if I hold down shift and I go over it, the computer actually sort of warns me there's a triangle by showing that sort of pink area there. I can fill it in anyway, that's just fine. So now that I've deleted the history, I'll just continue to work to fill these existing points in. If I want to get rid of a section, I can just hold down Control and Shift, so that was remove a polygon here. So if that's a problem, then do that. It's fine. Because really, I'd like to change this up a little bit. I think I'd like to put a polygon there, and there, and there. So I've got a very low poly object that describes what I'm doing reasonably well. Um, the only part I really got to fill in is the bottom here. Uh, sometimes to fill in a section, uh, it can be easier to just use the multi-cut tool um, and cut out the hole that you've created than actually using quad draw. I'm just using quad draw here because it's what I've been doing throughout the rest of it. But um, pretty often, what I like to do instead is just fill the holes, like select an edge here, use mesh, fill hole. Um, and then use mesh tools, multi-cut, and just cut up the hole however you want. Sometimes that's easier than actually sort of manually drawing it. This, this seems a bit wasteful. But, or a bit of a waste of time, I guess I should say. Um, Uh, most of that is sorted out. Uh, if I think if I have a, if I do have a triangle on here, I'd prefer not to have the triangle on one of these edges. So in that case, let's just do something like that. And then if there is going to be a triangle, it can be here. There we go. So what's important is that all of these polygons are, you know, of similar size. They're not completely square and they're not all exactly the same size, but they are all in the right ballpark. They're there's no polygons that are absolutely tiny than other ones. The other thing is that uh, we want to avoid polygons that are really stretched out. And I am noticing that some of these here are a little bit stretched out. It would probably be nice to have like an extra edge loop coming through here. Um, and what I could do for that is I could have an extra edge loop in here. And then I could move all of these down a bit and of course then they're you know they might be sort of stretched out the other way but I should be able to find some way to balance this reasonably well
These polygons at this point, they seem a little bit more similar to all the polygons around them. It also allows me to move some of these down to even this out a little more. So my main concern here is that the polygons aren't stretched out and they're all very similar size. And of course if they match the underlying shape well. Uh, it's good, of course, this quad draw tool, um, as I work here, it's, it's keeping everything on the model. So it is for the most part going to keep the underlying shape. feel like um, this can probably remain quads just a little bit higher up. I mean, maybe if there's going to be a triangle, it should be like there. Let's see. And that polygon is pretty small. But if this is stretched out a little differently, it might actually be better that way. Let's see. Really what you want to do fairly often is just compare the largest polygons to the smallest polygons and make sure that they're not a significant difference. Because in ZBrush when you subdivide, you're always subdividing everything the same. So back to my regular select tool and just quickly hide this new surface so I can see how it matches up with the old one there. Um, some of these points are kind of floating away from the edge that they were supposed to represent. So I want to be careful about that. I might want to try to put some of these back on a little bit. Um, which of course then they're going to be stretched out. It's all a giant balancing act. Go back to the quad draw, uh, look at those edges. I just see if they floated off too far or not. Uh, this is where I was purposefully kind of breaking away from the edge because I knew that I wanted this to form a nice clean edge loop all the way around. So I'm not going to worry about the fact that that doesn't line up too well. It'll be good enough. Uh, the bottom's not really that important, so I mean I could spend a bit more time evening the solo and everything, but it doesn't really matter that much because it's just the bottom of the object. Okay, that is probably good enough. Um, it's pretty sparse up at the top, um, you know, that'll work, but there might be times when it makes more sense to have a little bit more uh, detail up at the top. Um, you know, and I could do that, I could get rid of this triangle and actually have another loop in there, and I think maybe that is worth doing, so let's just try this here. So, get rid of that and that. It'll give us some small line, some small edges. Uh, they're not going to be that small though, um, and they describe a fairly important part of the shape. So I'm not too worried about them putting in. You will have this happen. That's kind of one of the reasons I want to show this is because you'll have sections where you have to make some polygons a little bit smaller than you might otherwise want to. As long as you don't have any ones that are giant or super stretched out compared to sort of the average, it's not really that bad. If you have a couple that are a little on the small side, um, you know, they're not, it's not like these are completely tiny. They're just a little bit on the small side. They're a little bit more rectangular. Um, 
but it's because they're sort of defining a, um, you know, a fairly sharp shape here. Um, and you're gonna have times when your sort of lowest, your low versions of the shape need just a little bit more of that. Um, just keep in mind that that is gonna result in more polygons in that section in your really high poly versions of the object. You sort of have an unnecessary amount potentially of high polys in that section. So again, we can just kind of try to even that out so they're not so stretched. All right, um, you know, we managed to avoid having a couple of triangles we had before there. Of course, the expense was that now we have some polygons that are a little bit more stretched out, but not too bad. Yeah, that'll be good enough. There is a part of the shape we're not really capturing very well here. We have to ask ourselves how important that is, um, whether or not it actually warrants us trying to capture it at this level or not. I'm thinking it's probably not that important. Um, you know, we can capture it in our higher levels uh, in ZBrush, and that's probably fine. So. That should be, you know, good enough for now. really just because it's such a sharp shape there. At least a sharp shape on the low poly version of this object. Okay, so uh, once I have that ready, um, delete that, on. I'll uh, go back to object mode, select the object, I'll call this retop I never named the layer before. There we go. And I will export that out. So I don't need anything other than an OBJ file for this. It'll be just fine. There we go. Uh, I can delete the history just by selecting anything Alt Shift D. I mean, ideally, most of the time it's better to delete the history before you export. But the OBJ file can't even contain the history anyway, so Maya will always sort of wipe out the history in the OBJ file because OBJ files all they hold is vertex positions for the most part. There's a little bit of other data in there, but not much. Um, so that should be good enough. So there are some triangles here, but we're going to see those kind of disappear as we go into ZBrush. So in order to add some new information in ZBrush, to add a new subtool here, um, I'm going to use a append. Um, I'm just going to click this poly mesh 3D, which is like we'll call it the poly star or whatever. Um, you'll see people use this a lot in ZBrush just as a temporary object, um, simply to get overwritten by something else. So just by adding any new shape here. Uh, and I can go to import, and import will overwrite this shape, so I can import that delete me object. And there it is. There's that one I just made in Maya. I can switch to the other versions of this model. So you're going to see sculpt here is lots of detail. So this was my decimated one. And this is my retopo. So now I can start dividing this object and projecting it onto the sculpt that I have that has so much of that detail. So in order to do this, um, primarily what I'm going to use is I'm going to be using divide here. And I want to smooth it. Um, normally I use smooth UVs. This object doesn't have good UVs yet. We're going to make some good UVs later. But I also want to show you that you don't necessarily have to have that done right away. You can kind of add them in there later if you want. So I can divide, and of course I can go up higher, and I can divide it as much as I want. 
Um, but it's important that when I do that, I'm actually keeping the model on the original reference mesh because I don't want to lose that original shape. And like you're going to see, it's already starting to deviate just even that one little bit of dividing. Um, so there's a function in here I can do called project. Um, and as long as your original model matches pretty well uh, with this, then you should be able to project no problem. So here's my retopo. Um, here's my original date. They both line up pretty well. Um, this is, of course, it after I've hit divide. But that'll work OK. So what I can do now that I've divided it is I'll make sure that only the sculpt is visible. So this little eye is turned on on the retopo, it's turned on on the sculpt, but on the decimated one here it's off. That means I'm only projecting to the sculpted one when I hit project all. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit project all, and it's just going to put these verts on the surface of that sculpted object. Um, I might have to turn the distance up to find them. There you go but that should project reasonably well. Uh, and then I'm just going to go up a level and project again. Now it sucks having to switch back and forth between these palettes. There's other ways around it, but one of the easiest things I can do is I can just divide it by hitting Control D instead of going to the palette there. So if I hit project all, as long as those verts are already pretty close, uh, they should work fine. So. Yeah, that's fine. I can try projecting again, make sure nothing changes, but it looks like it's all good. Uh, so if I want to divide again, um, D goes to like the next subdivision level. And if I just push D as many times, just D on its own, um, it'll just go to the furthest subdivision level of the object. Of course, I can project again. At this point, I don't have any more subdivision levels. So I can hit Control D again and project all again and control D again and project all again. So as I do this I get more and more detail into this model that actually has good topology. So when we actually look at the edge structure on this model it makes sense and it kind of flows with the shape of it. And what you're also going to note is that what used to be a triangle down here is now three quads, and they're a little bit more stretched out than the ones around them, um, but any other way of putting an object together would result in quads like this anyway. Um, so some triangles there in the lowest first, not too bad, and even if I go back up here, so there's the version with triangles. The very first level has no triangles, and this is probably not even enough polygons in terms of uh, you know making UVs and all that and whatnot. So this is probably about as low as I would ever need that object. So if you have a super low model and your super low model has some triangles, it's really no big deal because they're going to be gone as soon as you go one level up anyway. And really, I never need a lower poly model than this, ultimately. This is already you know, 276 poly, it's super low. Um, so you know, if I'm in ZBrush and I'm sculpting and things on this model, the, the odds of me needing something lower than this are pretty, pretty tiny. Um, if I did have to get something really low, say for a game engine or something like that, I would actually manually make that low object probably from this instead of starting from this object because I'm going to be able to go on here and more intelligently remove things and decide exactly where I want the detail um, than just you know using something like this. Um, whereas in this I was very worried about the polygons not being stretched out and whatnot so that when they subdivided they would give me nice even sizes. Um, where I had about the same number of polygons everywhere on the model, and all the polygons were pretty similar sizes. And really, that's about the smallest one there, and that's not that terrible in terms of difference of size from some of the larger ones, like that'd be one of the larger polygons there. So, just keep going up with the divisions, and right now, you know, 17,000 verts, that's really not that much, but let's divide again, and project all again. Uh, after a while, this projectile will start to get awfully slow. That's okay, because you'll start getting these poly counts really high. That's perfectly fine. So 
So we're going to eventually get somewhere where we're about a million polys or maybe four million polys or something like that. Um, and at some point we're going to decide that it's enough detail. I mean at this point this might already be enough detail. If we look down at our... Here's our current one with the good topology. And then if I go back to the sculpt here we'll see the difference. Okay. So the sculpt definitely has a little bit more detail down there. Um, but it's also got four million polygons. And our retopo one is nowhere even close to there. So we'll keep dividing this retopo a couple more times. And we'll get up to about the same level. And then we should get be able to put the sort of same amount of detail into our retopo one as we had in the original sculpt. So ideally, uh, good topology actually helps you get the detail that you want. And actually helps you paint detail in good places and everything. Um, you know, it helps it be non-wasteful. But there's a lot of other good reasons to have the better topology, such as being able to make UV mapping, uh, being able to rig the object, things like that. There's a lot of good reasons for it. So, Generally speaking, you can't just use the Dynamesh topology or something. It won't work very well. So we're definitely getting there with the projection. Uh, we still need a bit more detail. But we're getting close. I will divide this one more time. So I'll hit Control D. There we go. That's going to give me up to 4.5 million. That's a lot. Um, that okay? Uh, that'll be okay. This will allow me to do one last projection, um, and it'll be pretty close to the detail on the original sculpt. So I'll hit Project All one more time. Uh, I'm not actually going to wait for it in the video. I'll stop here so you don't have to wait. It would probably take about three minutes or something. Um, really depends on the speed of your computer. And I think this one's not particularly fast. So, Okay, so now that the projection is done, we have this object mostly ready. We've got pretty much all the detail in here. If we zoom in, um, you know, at this point, of course, we can paint more in or do whatever we want that way, but we have the information that we would have wanted to recover from the old model. Uh, what we don't have at this point is we don't have any good meaningful UVs on this model. Other than that, it's basically done. Um, but we don't really have any useful UVs on the model, so we do want to fix that up. Um, the other thing is that our lowest division right now is essentially useless. It doesn't really describe anywhere near enough of the shape. In fact, it's so low that it's not even worth UVing that model because we can get much better UVs on this level or this level, on either level two or three. Um, I think for this model, because it's fairly simple, this level two would be good enough. Um, I mean, even that's only about 300 triangles. Um, you know, as we start getting higher, it starts getting to the point where we have um, a lot more information, we get more meaningful UVs. If this was a really large object, a really important object, um, then I would probably use a higher level for the model in Maya. Um, really depends on how important the object is to you, but uh, if you use something this low as your base level, you expect to get a lot of things like stretching and textures that you paint and things like that because your UVs won't really be matched up very well to the final shape. So I'd, ha I'd consider this as me maybe the lowest sort of useful mesh so I can say delete lower at this point because this model is essentially useless. I don't need this anymore. So I'm going to go to um, subdivision level 2 here, which is just, of course, 1 up from the base level, which is 1. And I'll say delete lower. And now this is my base mesh. There just isn't any lower subdivisions to work with. Um, that means that if I make UVs for the model, if I do anything else for the model, it's this that I'll be working with. So if I'm going to edit the model in Maya, I'll be editing this. Um, you know, this is still pretty far on the low side. I could potentially use a little bit higher if I wanted. Um, that would be fine. But for a model, for a model like this where um, it's not a particularly complex thing anyway, um, and it's not necessarily of particular importance, um, we can use something like this. Basically, if you have something really important, you're probably going to want to send 
higher subdivision levels into Maya and actually work with them there. Um, but this will be enough for the UVs on something like this. So I'll just export this level. And then we'll take this back into Maya and we'll make some UVs. So in Maya, I'll import that model that I just made. Um, most of the time when you bring something into Maya, particularly if it's uh, an object that you're going to continue using, it's important to unlock the normals, um, soften the edges. You're going to see the object uh, shades pretty funny here. Sometimes it'll shade actually much, much worse because ZBrush very often makes fairly useless normals on objects. Um, having more uh, meaningful, smooth normals is going to be a lot more useful. So I can go to normals here. I can say unlock normals. Go to normals, soften edge. There we go. So this looks like a lot more um, typical how we'd want it in Maya. Um, particularly, um, this is definitely what I want if I was baking a normal map or baking a displacement map or something like that. Uh, particularly if any model was ever going into a game engine, then you would really care about it. Um, because then, in, in actual in-engine, every hard edge is more expensive than every soft edge. So, At this point, we can create some basic planar mapping, um, which the reason that I'm creating planar mapping at this point isn't to even create useful UVs, it's just to actually eliminate all seams on the object. Um, if there's any kind of mapping on there uh, right now, it might be giving me seams in places where I don't actually want it. So by just using planar mapping, I can quickly eliminate all the seams on the object. So it'll have incredibly terrible stretched mapping right now, but it'll still work well enough. Um, I can go to the UV texture editor temporarily and just take a look at that. I can turn on my display checker tiles display here and then I can see that there's no seams but it gets incredibly stretched out here which looks terrible but that's fine I got the first point point done which is just to eliminate those seams so now what I can do is I can start putting in seams where I want them and get Maya to unfold this model in a way that I think actually makes sense to me so I think what I'd probably like to do is get a strip that goes all the way around here, maybe just not including the top, and then unfold the bottom and the top separately. That way I'll end up with sort of the least amount of seams in this, so I'll probably put a seam somewhere down the back here, um, maybe around there and then try to avoid anything else around it this way. So in order to start putting seams in the object, I'll go to display, polygons, and I'll say texture border edges. And now it's gonna draw any seams on the model as thicker lines, and I can't see them right now because there aren't any seams, but as soon as I create some seams, you're gonna see those appear as thicker lines, and I'll point that out when I do it. Um, so if I'm ready to create some seams now, I can just select some edges. So for example, I'm going to select this section on the bottom here. So just underneath that edge loop. I'll quickly turn off this uh, checker tiles display here. There we go. So that can be a seam for the bottom. Uh, if I want later, I could like eliminate one of these and sew it back together. But it's probably fine like this because we're unlikely to see the bottom of this rock. Um, you know, if it's sitting on the ground, which is essentially the way I've modeled it to work here. So I can now use edit UVs, cut UV edges. And now those are seams. And now we're not necessarily going to be able to see that in the texture right away, but when I unfold, Maya now knows it's allowed to cut this here. So the UVs don't have to be attached to each other right in there. And then I can come up with uh, another place on the model that I think. is a good place to cut it. Um, you know, this line here, that looks pretty reasonable. Let's try that. 
Now I don't need the bottom. So if I want to just get it for this length, I can click on this. So I've got one edge and then I'm following it up. And then I'm going to hold down shift and double click and it'll get those two. And do the next one. Then hold down shift and double click again up here and it'll get that. So I can cut those edges. And then I can go around the top of this object here and I can cut these as well. And that should be able to unfold reasonably well at this point. So now I can use edit UVs and unfold. And I can use the unfold 3D method here. Uh, if you don't see the unfold 3D method, it's probably because you have to go into your plugin manager and find unfold 3D and turn it on. Um, so to unfold these UVs, I'm just going to go into UV mode, which I can use by right clicking or holding down the right mouse button and going over to UV mode here. Uh, or I can just push F12. Uh, if I want to instantly select all the UVs on an object, I usually just hold down control and push F12 and that converts the selection here, that was F11 accidentally hold down control, push F12 and that will convert the selection to the UVs so now I can unfold those and then if I go to the UV texture editor I'll see how they unfolded, which was reasonably well and the only downside to um, this sort of way that it's unfolded here is that we're not using the space all that efficiently so Sometimes, if you have a lot more seams in the object, um, you'll be able to use up the space in that picture a lot better. Um, I can try just getting a few UVs here, uh, converting it to shell, um, and editing this myself and seeing if I can come up with a better layout here because, yeah, like that, that's potentially a lot more useful. put these together, then I can select all the UVs and scale them up, and try to use up as much of the space as possible. Okay, so I can't really scale these UVs up much without pushing those islands either through each other or up against the edge of the image, so that's kind of enough space there. So those UVs should work okay. Uh, if I look at the checker tiles again then I can see the mapping it's pretty consistent size there's not a lot of stretching happening there's some seams obviously but they're not too bad um, you know I've tried to put them in the places where I guessed it would be the least noticeable um, I had to put some seams up on the top here well, it's not too terrible. So now I can delete those, or delete the history for that object again, Just that's just Alt, Shift, and D. There we go. And then I can export this back for ZBrush. Go into ZBrush, and here's my retopo object. Now I'm not going to make a new object because I didn't change the topology of the object, because all I did was change the UVs. Um, if I import, it'll just replace this lower, this lowest level, and all the other levels will automatically um, be correct, and I don't have to reproject or anything. So if you're not changing the topology, if you're not adding extra edge loops or deleting polygons or something like that, if all you're doing is moving verts or moving UVs or editing UVs, um, then it'll work fine if you just import over top of the existing model. So. I've got my retopo here, and this is what I want. So I'm just going to hit import, choose that OBJ. And we don't really seem to see anything change, but remember, I didn't have any UVs on before. If I want to see the new UVs that have been created, I can go into the UV map here. There we go. And I can hit morph UV, and it'll just give us a preview. There we go. 
And now we can see those UVs that I created before. They're sort of drawn in 3D. It's pretty strange. They're kind of flipped in ZBrush too. Um, don't worry too much about exactly how they appear. Just understand that they're there and that's what matters. So as long as I can see them, it should be all right. Let's switch this back. ZBrush's uh, ways of showing UVs is pretty strange, but it works. So I can see that they're there. Um, and now if I do anything with the model, uh, it'll have UVs, so now I can, um, you know, start baking textures and things like that. I could export a displacement map, etc. Uh, at this point, though, I can just save the ZBrush file here. Just save the tool. It'll save as. There we go. Pretty much got everything in this object the way I want it. Uh, I don't even have any need for these other ones anymore. This uh, this old rock. That's useless. That's a decimated one. I don't need it. Uh, same thing with the sculpt. Don't need that anymore either. Um, you know, I just need this final one, and this is the one that has all the subdivision levels. So I push D, I can go up to the higher levels here. And if I push Shift D, I can go back down to the lower levels. There's proper UVs, you know, everything about this object basically is, you know, sort of ready. This, this object is made in a way that's relatively correct. It'll work well with the rest of the pipeline. You know, it's going to be pretty easy to bake textures for this. It's going to be pretty easy to, um, you know, use this for rendering or to make a game version of this model. Um, I think, in general, it's very important if you're working on anything, any model that really matters, anything that, um, you know, is really going to be a part of your pipeline and all that, um, to make sure that at some point during that process you get the model to this stage where you have the same, you have one model where you can step through the subdivision history and has good topology all the way to the bottom, you know, um, but then has all your detail up at the top. And as you can see, you know, even if you paint that with some other method like Dynamesh or something, you can get it all back with the projections like what I did. So it's really not too hard to get there. And even if you use a different program, like even if you used a program like 3D Coat or Blender to do all your original sculpting, and that's completely fine um, because you can still just go through the process here where you retopo and just use that other processes, use that old um, you know model from 3D Coat or Blender, any other sculpting package, right? Just use that as a reference. Um, you know, do retop over it, and then just project onto that other model that you brought in. The model that you use as reference doesn't have to be a ZBrush model. Like you can just import any OBJ, just, and it can be very high poly if you want. Um, but having a model like this, is, I consider extremely key. And one of the biggest problems that I see a lot of students having um, is they have situations where they like maybe have a high poly model and they have a low poly model, but they don't have a single model that is available as both. And that's what's so important is that it's one model, but I can get it down to a pretty low poly level. I can get it up to a really high poly level and you know in at all those different places the edge loops are going to flow nicely it's going to have uvs it's going to be set up you know correctly and all those things and it's going to match um you know having an object set up like that is really important and even if i have a complicated scene of a lot of objects right uh, i can just have a lot of different sub tools in here and my different objects can just be represented by different sub tools and you can have a character made of like a hundred sub tools or an environment with a whole bunch of different subtools, and that's fine. That that works very well. So, you know. try to get a model made uh, like this and get used to getting your models to work this way, where they have multiple subdivision levels, uh, and everything else in your pipeline will be much easier.